So it was sort of fun um, for me to um, come up with this talk today. Uh, Two Truths and a Lie actually is a game that I play uh, with my students in my different courses. And I, I have student, I use um, student active learning and divide my classes into teams. And so um, this is a communication game where um, uh, people go around and talk to their fellow team members and other class members and they tell two truths about themselves in one line. And the object is um, to develop communication skills and try to fake others out. And no one has ever guessed all these years. I always play it with my class classes. No one's ever guessed uh, what my truth was because uh, the truths are so outrageous. So I thought for fun, my career is um, about to end, at least this career. I want to go on and um, develop some computer skills and maybe um, develop computer games for kids. Um, but um, so I thought it would be appropriate, rather than telling you about my latest research, which is with baby spiderlings, but, um, that I would sort of review uh, my career. And because it was, I've taken some interesting pathways. And so um, that's what I'm going to talk with you about today. And you can interrupt me at any time. It uh, really doesn't matter. Um, I, can, I think I can handle that. But um, I started out initially um, trying to decide what I wanted to do. And I had played the French horn in high school and was very successful with that. Um, had a number of scholarships for summer programs. And I thought I might play the French horn and go into music. But um, at the age of seven, I had scarlet fever, a very high temperature, and I lost the hearing. and a sense of balance on my um, left ear. And, um, and I've compensated for the loss of balance, but my hearing never came back. And so I decided I'd be at a disadvantage um, in a music career. So I also love to read. And so I said, well, I'll be an English major and I'll um, write books. And I took my first English class at the University of Wisconsin and the lecture was so boring. <laughs> I mean, I, and I didn't need this person to tell me how to interpret what I was reading. And so uh, I was also at the time taking a zoology class and an anthropology class. And I said, these are so much more interesting and challenging. So I think I'm going to um, go into one of these two areas. And um, my first research experience was um, through anthropology, actually, um, and the Primate Center. And um, they had um, two spider monkeys. And I remember the names to this day because they were such brats. Louie and Snowball. And, um, and my goal, what I was challenged to do, was to set up an experiment where I would put them through different, um, you know, dump, um, um, jungle gym type things and I look at their bra uh, brachiation patterns, you know, how they were uh, using their arms and legs to move. But the problem was that they um, were accustomed to humans and they wouldn't perform. Instead, they'd um, come up and bother me or they'd throw bottles at me. And um, they, were, they were escape artists. They'd get on the roof of the uh, biology building, I'd get a call from the janit janitorial service saying, your monkeys are on the roof, you know, can, you know. If, so I, I decided I can't do that. And um, so I was looking for um, something to do. And I took a field zoology class. Um, and it was just because it was a class that was available. And one of my, uh, back then you had to either be in a dorm or sorority, so I was a sorority person who was charged $2 every time I wore pants uh, on campus. They saw me, um, which was all the time, of course, um, given my um, career choice. But um, I um, took this class, and it was mainly uh, designed to collect fish for the um, Zoological Museum. Um, but I was always getting wet. You know, the 
they didn't have fuel boots for women and I'd get them stuck and at one point they had to actually pull me out of the water because I went under. Um, and so I said, well, I'm just going to carry the bottle for the fish guys. And there were only two women in the class anyway. And so um, what happened was what's out in the fall in Wisconsin or anywhere this, that is a lot of spiders. And so I started collecting spiders in a jar that was supposed to have fish in it. And um, so in order to get a decent grade in the class, I had to learn how to ID them. And, um, and of course, the um, director of the museum, zoological museum, was a professor in charge of the course. And he saw that I was really getting good at this. And so he made me an offer when I, and then he found out I was a good student at the end. And so he said, well, he approached me and he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you promise to work on the spider collection for the museum, um, I will give you, um, I have outside my office, there's some steps that go up to the roof and there are three rooms up there and I'll let you have them. Um, and so you'll see the picture of Birch Hall and the little yellow um, sex strip there, that, that was my quarters with my buddies, um, whoever I wanted to have up there with me. And um, so I, um, I started working on the spider collection and became very good at um, systematics. Um, and um, notice I, I'm putting these little things here, like encounter with the law. Well, I also TA'd that course that I had originally taken and when I um, was TAing one time, we would always go to these trout streams and things. A warden game, a farmer would call the warden, and we'd be, we were chased off of guns and things from time to time, because we'd just go any stream. I'm sure all the fish people know about that, right, Dave? You, know, you go out and do sane, and if somebody catches you, you run. Well, um, the warden caught me, caught us. I was a TA, and he said, I've got you for six counts of tampering with the balance of nature. And I said, why six counts? He said, you have six sanes in the water. <laughs> um, so, we're, um, so I went to jail. And it wasn't until that night that um, they, I was able to get a hold of the, uh, my major professor, the professor in charge of the course, and to get the, um, the permit delivered so that I could get out of jail because we did have a permit for collecting. Um, what year was that? Oh, that was in, um, well, let's see, I got my PhD in the 73, so it would have been in the six, late 60s. Um, yeah. yeah, that's a long time ago. I'm, I'm ancient, you know. Okay, so, <laughs> so I start, uh, I had an NSF uh, fellowship initially and um, they, um, the um, department um, because I was doing all this um, work with the museum collections and so forth, they wanted uh, to keep me employed. And so they, they uh, gave me this position called Arboretum Zoologist for the uh, University of Wisconsin Arboretum. And um, one of the things that we did was um, we, they have like a, every two years they burn the prairies. And I, uh, my first, uh, I think it was my first paper was on the um, effects of burning on the spider community uh, in these um, um, <coughs> prairies. But I also wrote a lot of articles um, for the arboretum that went out to all the people. And at one point, I, you'll see that I said unwelcome proposal. Well, the unwelcome proposal was that I suggested, I was suggesting animals and plants that should be reintroduced to the prairies that were lost and one was the prairie rattlesnake. They weren't very happy about having people walking along trails with the rattlesnake. So, um, but anyway, I still, I still feel that that would have been okay to do, but Did they, they didn't like it. Did they, it ever come back? Uh, the prairie rattlesnake? No, not that I know of. Um, was that the so, hmm? Was that the yeah, mm-hmm. I, um, 
So I'm still, this is still at a stage when I'm trying to decide what I wanted to do as for my doctoral research. I mean, I do, had published the prairie work and I was looking at other prairies and sort of looking at the communities, but it didn't really excite me. And so meanwhile, they were taking the, um, this um, research group up in um, Hessler Biology, whenever the professors went somewhere, they would take me along to collect spiders. So one of the, the they had a grant to work on the Galapagos tortoise. So I got to go um, on a collecting trip all the way down uh, to Panama and then we took, we, um, I think we flew from Panama to the Galapagos Highlands, but, uh, or to uh, um, Ecuador and then a boat to the Galapagos. But on, um, on the way down, I, prevent, I helped prevent a war, okay, between two countries. What happened was, we were driving down collecting, of course, and we arrived at um, um, San Salvador, um, and we were going to camp on the beach. We camped always, and um, these um, um, military people came up and they said, you can't camp here. They'll, um, there are banditos, they'll come and they'll shoot you, kill you, and take your vehicles. But you can come with us to uh, the um, colonel's villa and spend the night there within the closed walls and you'd be safe. So we, of course, took them up on the offer and we had, they served us, a, there were two colonels, they served us great meals and they started drinking and they started drinking more. And they started serenading us with their guitars and singing. And as the night wore on, they started telling us about their planned war. And they were going, they were um, fighting with Honduras. And what they wanted to do, what they planned was to be like Israel and they were gonna attack them with planes. And they told us the dates, everything, all the details. And so the next morning we said goodbye and you know, maybe an hour or two later, we crossed the bridge between um, um, El Salvador and Honduras. And on the other side of the bridge, there were US peacekeeping forces. So of course we pulled over and we had a nice long chat with them, gave them all the details and war never happened. So. So um, anyway, I went down to the Galapagos Islands and, um, and collected spiders as I also uh, was involved in, for instance, um, censusing what we were interested in, or a grad student that was working in this project, they were interested in uh, the fact that they, um, that the tortoises actually graze up in the high elevations where there's a, a lot of grass and moisture but they, uh, the females have to come down about 12 miles of lava rock um, to the shoreline um, to lay their eggs in the sand. And so um, in addition to collecting spiders all along this um, uh, trail and also um, documenting the vegetation change, I um, timed uh, the tortoises, the females that happened to be around when I was there. And just to give you an example of how arduous, arduous this is for a tortoise to make that trip, is this one female I was watching as I was um, collecting samples, I had a stopwatch to do this. She spent 47 minutes climbing probably a hill that was no bigger than the, the ceiling here. And she lost her footing. And this big, you know, 900 pound animal rolled down the hill, and, but she landed upright. And seven minutes later, a leg came out and she started up again. Um, but I decided um, that the Galapagos Island um, research there wasn't for me because they deliberately had not stamped my passport on the way in. So when I wanted to get out of Ecuador, I couldn't. They wanted lots of money and it took me a week and um, several hundred dollars and bribe money to get out. Have you ever been back to the Galapagos? Uh, no. <laughs> not that I recall. No, I've been a lot of places, but not there. So, um, 
How much time do we have? <laughs> what, what time? Uh, I just want to make sure. I... 15, 20 minutes. Okay. I will have to go faster. But basically what happened is and I, I took another trip with the group, and they were interested in the uh, black uh, races of um, versus uh, light uh, black races or melanistic races of, uh, of mice uh, that were on the um, lava beds in New Mexico. And they were comparing um, the color patterns and the frequency of these rodents uh, on grassland versus lava beds. And they took me along, of course, to collect spiders. And I um, got to this site, and I looked, and I saw all these webs, nicely spaced. And on both habitats, the lava bed and on the grassland, and I said, this is where I'm going to do my work. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare um, how an animal um, survives uh, and um, reproduces on the grassland versus on this more harsh uh, desert environment. And so I teamed up. I had taken a class in heat transfer physics models with a new professor, um, Warren Porter, at Wisconsin at the time. And I teamed up with um, um, a grad student um, and who uh, came from that lab, and we um, did this model. I collected all the data for two years. I spent seven months of each year um, on these, um, camped on this lava bed by myself. Now, sometimes I'd have students, but often um, I was um, there alone. And at night, um, I had some interesting experiences. For instance, light suddenly appearing in my windows, which made me have almost a religious experience. But um, this, this is in my tent, of course, um, which turned out to be um, about 50 miles away. There's a, uh, an Air Force base, and they were doing night activities. Um, but an, another thing is, you know, I love to read um, mystery horror novels, and I was reading this book called uh, Murder on Ch in Cherry Hill Subdivision or something to that extent. And one night I was, you know, in my tent reading uh, and I heard this thump, 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 like somebody was coming through the sand to me and I was panicked. I mean, I had to hatch it out, a knife to cut through the back. And I just had a malmute, you know, a female who was, would lick anybody. <laughs> um, so um, I was just to totally frightened, and I, I, you know, weeks went by, and I didn't know, maybe months, I didn't understand what, where that sound had come from, but, and it turned out that um, I discovered what it was, and that was up at the top of the hill, there was a um, big tank that they had full of molasses and it had a belt, and the cows would lick it and, went in, uh, and get that molasses. And when it got near empty, and they went up there at night, and they were licking, and go thump, 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 thump. So, um, so I developed these heat transfer physics models, and that would predict where the spiders would be located uh, in the habitat based on uh, their temperature because you get too hot during the day and then at night they needed um, to um, um, gain heat to stay active and so they even directed their funnels in a particular uh, direction to get that night um, heat in but to get uh, to avoid it uh, during the day and so I predicted that in these depressions or under shrubs there would be there should be clusters of webs and but that wasn't the case. They were spaced out. And so that's what led me to think that, um, that there must be competing for websites and that they might be at least maintain some space between um, nearest neighbors um, so that they could get, get more food. And I um, started looking at interactions between individuals introducing. I, I discovered that if you took an individual away from its web, at one of these sites, a new individual appeared. So they were like waiting in the wings to get a good site. Um, 
And so I started doing um, interactions between them. And I, um, when I got back that year to um, look at my data, I saw um, a paper by uh, Parker and, and John Maynard Smith on evolutionary game theory. And, um, and the kinds of things that I was seeing in my spiders really fit that very well. So I, I you know, acknowledged uh, their work. And um, all of a sudden, well, John Maynard Smith, this famous evolutionary biologist who had come up with evolutionary game theory, he reviewed the paper. And he got in touch with somebody who might know me and said, I need to talk to this Reichert. And so they arranged uh, a tel telephone conversation. He didn't email. Uh, and he said, come spend a year with me in England. Um, who could turn that down? And in England, uh, when, when I got to England, just yell at me if I have to stop, because I don't have to finish this. It's a long history. Um, when I got to England, um, John, uh, um, John was most interested in um, how do animals leave a contest, um, when, when to leave. Um, and. Uh, as opposed to doing evolutionary um, models with me. He was, and because he had this idea that uh, it would have to do with um, the, um, <coughs> the balance between two genetic components, um, that is fear and aggression. And so we did a bunch, we did several papers on uh, the genetics that underlie the uh, aggressive phenotype versus uh, more social phenotype at another habitat. And Peter Hammerstein from um, um, Zelton's lab in Germany had come to visit. All these famous people would come and visit um, John Maynard Smith. And so Peter Hammerstein and I uh, then developed the, uh, did the game theory, theoretic uh, analyses for um, um, pa different papers um, instead of John. and. <clears throat> Whenever it rained uh, in the desert, I discovered that everything was underwater. And I, um, at first, I, I think I called my major professor, was almost in tears because it was, uh, everything drowned. And he said, that, that happens every year, Susan. I'm sure that some survive or the babies survive. It turned out that if you uh, were very aggressive and successful at a good website, then, um, you will have, you would have produced your egg sacs, and the egg sacs would be impermeable to water um, before before the uh, rains hit. And so, uh, but I would go to uh, the Southwestern Research Station in Arizona just to hang out while everything was underwater at my uh, other study site. And one day, um, somebody said to, to me, I, "I go and do experiments. You can see me there." I was thin then. <laughs> um, but I, um, I do experiments. And somebody said, well, Susan, the same spiders are, that are in New Mexico are here. And it turned out that indeed they were. Same species, but very different behavior. And um, so the reason why the, these animals in Arizona were fearful is that they had very high bird populations and the birds were wiping them out. And I always did experiments to demonstrate that. Um, and that the riparian area in Arizona uh, meets uh, arid uh, pine woodland and then cactus scrub habitat in the same area. And um, there's a problem with the animals that are um, migrating and mating with the other phenotype. And uh, that is um, <laughs> that um, it's this gene flow that's going on between these populations limits adaptation to um, the particular site. So we'd get super aggressive animals or super fearful. And uh, that was a very interesting um, result. And Ellen Alda came to visit uh, American Science Frontiers. 
and he did a whole show uh, on uh, going to called going to extremes on this particular system. Were you featured in it? Yes, yes. He and I, uh, we had a long pitfall uh, trap. Yeah, the whole thing uh, had me in it, and um, we were um, sampling all these pitfalls. And he'd pick up something, he'd say, oh, that's a spider. You know, this is a yellow spider. And I said, no, that's a scorpion. <laughs> oh, you know. And, um, so, you know, you know how uh, Alan Alda was, you know. And he decided, by the way, both Maynard Smith and Alan Alda de said, decided that I was an OK person because I could beat them at Scrabble. <laughs> Maynard Smith and his wife and his son, they, tried, they cheated to try and beat me. And they never were successful. So, um, so anyway, um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so I'm going to have to be real quick here just to cover a few other areas. I've worked in so many different areas um, because I've just let the system take me wherever it went. Uh, we wanted to really visit, um, go to really look at true social um, systems. And so we went to, uh, had the opportunity to work in Gabon on the uh, social Agelina uh, species there. And my early morning scare was, I thought it was a poacher who had killed the cook that was walking down the path with a machete, but it turned out it was an elephant, which might be just as bad. And it was swinging its um, uh, trunk at me. Um, so we worked on the uh, social spider spiders in Gabon that are, um, they're highly inbred, only about 10% um, are males because you only need enough brothers to, to breed the females, um, the sisters. And they're um, really, uh, they cooperate in prey capture. The only time I ever saw them compete was when who was going to get to drag the prey item into the nest for the babies to eat because you really couldn't coordinate a whole pile of animals moving. So they would sort of jostle with one another over that. And we discovered um, that there was um, uh, a social, um, actually a spider that's quite social here in Tennessee. One of my grad students was um, Rob uh, Fury was um, out boating and he said, I found a colony of uh, this Analasma studiosus, um, which is, uh, had extended uh, maternal care down uh, in the tropics. Um, I found a colony, not just a single mom with her babies, but lots of females, 100 females, and I didn't believe them initially. Um, but indeed, um, uh, Tom Jones, who had worked on um, the um, the maternal behavior of mothers with their babies um, came down as a postdoc, and and uh, we spent a, um, several years uh, working. In fact, we're probably still collecting data now on um, the fact that there's a, a different reason for being social other than being in a tropical area, and that is that um, if in these higher elevate uh, latitudes, if it, um, temperatures start to drop takes, I mean, in cooler temperatures, it takes longer for the babies to mature. And therefore, if a mother dies, if you have other mothers that'll take over, um, then um, the babies will be taken care of by them. And so um, that's why we see the um, social behavior here. And then I think the final, well, final thing, uh, two final things, slides. One is um, because spiders tend to um, kill a lot before, uh, it's called wasteful killing before they actually consume the prey. Uh, they, uh, I decided that they might be very important in terms of biocontrol. So I had a whole series of uh, papers that we did in, um, and under EPA, Environmental Protection Agency monies. And they said, well, when they gave me my second grant, they said, we're just funding Susan Reichert's vegetable garden. Yeah. That's what we did. We had vegetable gardens down on my farm and at the house. Um, and so we had that. Um, the spider limiting effects on um, insect populations has to be a community 
um, phenomenon, not a, a single. And then the last slide, I just wanted to say that, you know, <coughs> you're, I chose a spider to work on, and everybody would say, why would you work on spiders? But there's some serendipity here because when um, some researchers from the um, uh, University of Utah um, Medical School wanted to potentially um, examine spider venoms for their um, medicinal functions, they contacted me because all the publications I had in the literature, and they said, "Come visit us. Can you and uh, can you suggest a, a spider that would be a good model that we could test? Because in with snakes, you've got your um, hemolymph, um, uh, sort of anticoagulant medicines, and with the cone shells, that's the venomous um, predaceous snail." Um, marine snail, we've got um, a kind of anesthesia that, uh, you know, you're, when you go into surgery and you're awake but you can't move. Um, but we're looking, we thought maybe spider venoms might be useful. So I said, well, um, why don't you use this desert spider that I work on that's such a successful animal and then only um, arrest the flight of insects. It doesn't kill them. It arrests them so they can't get away because it doesn't have a sticky web sheet. And so they, um, I came to visit them. I brought them spiders. I um, um, then placed a um, former student as a postdoc in their lab. And they found, um, well, within the first few, few weeks, they sent me a note saying, we've tested, we had a battery of three tests, and they said, this venom has two components of it has tr have tremendous anti-seizure capabilities. And so they said um, um, Pfizer Pharmaceuticals got involved and funded, they put something like 40, over 40 chemists on it to identify the, um, you know, what, what the uh, um, nature of this material was. And eventually, um, just actually last year, before I gave a talk to the trustees of the university, just a week before, um, Science Magazine came out, and there was a picture of my spider, front on view, Agilinopsis aparita. And why was it there? It was because they were, um, there were, what, 10,831 scientific journal pubs on this spider's venom. They discovered a whole new, um, calcium channel gate in the human nervous system they didn't know about. So um, if you have any needs for money, medicines for anti-seizures, epilepsy, cardiac function, migraines, osteoporosis, parathyroidism, Alzheimer's, you can thank me. <laughs> and that's the end. Um, and, and so on. You know, that's my tortoise. Um, he's uh, now about um, getting close to 200 pounds, and someday somebody's going to have to take him over for me because I'm, he's going to outlive me. So if any of you young people here think that you might want <laughs> to adopt a tortoise at some stage, let me know. Okay. Do we have time for questions? Sure. Absolutely. Any questions? Which one was the lie? What the... I didn't lie about anything in this one. Oh. <laughs> uh, I keep imagining working with spiders for a lifetime. This is so odd. How many times have you been bitten? Once. Oh, thank you. Oh, I was going to drag it in yeah. Only once was I bitten, and it was um, a male um, that... Um, had escaped, and I always have them in my hair and stuff and ask people where, do you see this spider, you know, um, shake. Um, but I had one um, in, <coughs> at the office, and a male, big male, got away, and I had uh, short sleeves on, and I saw it on my elbow, and I went like this, and I sort of squished it. And when you sort of squish them, they start, you know, their pincher, their uh, uh, mouth parts, 
They don't have piercing mouth parts like an insect. They have pinchers like, and it got me. And it was just a faint little prick, you know, I knew they had got me. I didn't kill them, of course, I just put them in a jar. And then about half an hour later, I had a, just a twinge of nausea. That was it. And, but I didn't need any drugs from them, you know. <laughs> just kidding. Um, so, yeah, just once. Yeah. Do you have Dave? any theories about how this maternal behavior developed over time? Oh, with the, with the uh, uh, social spiders? Yes. Um, I'm sure we probably um, have thought about it, but um, um, especially since you've got the solitary in one place and the maternal in the other, and it seems to be, again, this, this um, aspect of the fact that um, when you get further north, it takes longer for the babies to survive, um, to uh, mature, to be successful by, by themselves. And so if you're having mothers that die, then um, you've got to have some kind of um, system where other mothers could take over. So um, that's probably what happened is individuals that might um, be associated, be more tolerant of nearest neighbors, um, would build a web together and that would produce more offspring and so on. So that's likely what, you know, what we would uh, expect. But we're not going to see that thing happen, those individual events happen. Sure. All we can see are the results of what probably took a long time to happen. Do you have any sense of how long that time might have been? No. <laughs> Um, because we don't, you know, I mean, it could be hundreds of years, you don't, you just don't know. Yeah. Um, I think in a, one slide you talked about uh, animals mating at boundaries between different environments and it uh, reduce their ability to survive their behaviors. And does that have any, give you any insight about uh, behaviors versus genetic uh, uh. Well, actually, the, the model, what that did was um, demonstrated that the model that uh, Maynard Smith had come up with, with the, uh, where um, aggressiveness is inherited on the sex chromosomes and fear is autosomal and just sort of modifies the aggressiveness, that actually, um, when we had that whole um, ex big experiment where we had gene flow, <laughs> It really predicted what the frequency would be of the different behavior types, super aggressive, non-aggressive. In fact, um, when you get a mixing like that, we had like 19% never mated because the females ran from every male that ever approached them. Um, and there was another proportion that attacked, um, smaller, I think it was 8%, attacked every male, the females. Uh, females have the power in spiders. Maybe that's why I work on them. Uh, so, um, yeah, the males are just there as mating machines. Mm -hmm. well, this may be an elementary question. No, there's never such a <laughs> but thing. Do the babies, the baby spiders, migrate to the mother figure or vice versa? Does she find oh. the babies? Most spiders, they. Um, never um, interact with their mother. The mother um, builds the web, lays the egg case, and then maybe moves off to a new site to get a new web case. Now in these social spiders, um, the, baby, the babies, the mother is with the babies, and basically the babies hatch, and they're in the area of the egg sac, and the mother uh, brings food to them. Um, so. Does that answer your question? Well, I was just wondering if the surrogate mother, if the mother dies, oh. the surrogate mother finds the baby. Well, they, the but no, but see, these surrogate mothers are all in the same cluster with the oh. regular mother. They're all in the same, they're, um, they may even be sisters for all we know. Um, oh. And so they're there and um, they, they take, you know, they, they take, take joint home. care of all the babies. They regurgitate food and so forth. Okay. Mm-hmm, Gary? I, I, I suspect there's a lot of diversity in spider venoms. I 
mean, a lot of different spiders. Different um, there's not as much diversity as you might think. This agatoxin is the main. The, they call the whole class of spider venoms agatoxins now after Adrenopsis aperita. But the, um, the, uh, there's also, um, in addition to the medicinal value, um, they also are very important for um, now uh, being used in the development of um, insecticides. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. have you been sharing in the patents? <laughs> <laughs> I never got a patent, but I'll tell you what I did with this company um, when these two guys, I said, I was learning so much and I'd placed a student in their lab, I said, you know, I don't want any money. I, I was really enjoying learning about the system and working with other, other um, advisors on this, their scientific board, but I said, I sort of jokingly said, if you ever go public, give me some stock. So about three years after I had finished working with them, I got um, uh, and something in the mail that said, uh, we're giving you $15,001 shares of stock because we've gone public. Mm -hmm. And I did very well. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, um, that comp those two professors sold the company, and then another group got it. And the third time it sold, it sold for $2.8 billion. And that company um, went off the stock market. So that's when I had to sell the last of my stock. So, yeah. Uh, there's been a uh, documented uh, severe decline in insects. Is there a document decline in spiders? Um, I don't know, really. Um, I guess I'll have to go to the next arachnology meeting to see um, whether that's true or not. Um, but my guess is that probably they're going to be affected because if your insects go down, that's what they eat. Right. And so they're very dependent on, uh, they, don't, they don't feed on anything other than live moving insects. So that's a good question though. I'll, I'll check. I might report to somebody. Is spider venom, can it be classified as uh, reptile venom is into neurotoxic and hematoxic? Uh, I don't, let's see. Obviously, uh, the brown recluse has some hematoxic components, but um, usually, um, and uh, the black widow has neurotoxin. Um, but that's, I think that's all that's been done in, with respect to that, at least from what I know. Um, but that's an interesting question, too. Now, I would assume that Agilinopsis aperta, that's got to be a neural. Yeah, Dave? Um, I'm not a taxonomist at all, but I'm interested in, with the, so many spiders, how does one learn how to classify them? What kind of characteristics do you use? Okay, so um, base, uh, there are keys that help you with some basic characteristics, like where the spinnerets are relative to each other, um, and uh, eye rows, and so forth. But once you get down um, to looking at different species, you have to use um, the, mainly the male pelp, the male sexual organs. They have um, um, external pelps that, um, petty pelps in the females that are just, and babies that are just used for manipulating food, and the males they develop uh, into a, a pelpus that has all kinds of projections on it that fit only the female of that species. So it prevents mixing. And um, so that's how we, um, how we identify species, and I've never been particularly good at that. But we have, I have done a few papers on, on systematics, but not much. So, you know, relative to spiders, you know, I've talked in the past about, uh, about spiders, but, you know, I think a lot of people are, are kind of uh, spider reverse 
and mostly because of the, the danger. I mean, part of it's the just the appearance of, of spiders, but the danger is very limited because, for instance, I've had spiders in my clothes constantly. What I've been bitten once, mm -hmm. all these years. Um, now you have to be careful of the black widow mm -hmm. and the brown recluse. I wouldn't want to have them in my house. Um, you know, black widow bites usually are from um, um, people that you know put on a pair of shoes or gloves that were in a uh, a garage or whatever. Um, spiders don't bite to get any nutrition out of us. They get bitten, they bite because when you're squishing them, their mouth parts move. And that's the only, they don't have a piercing, they have pinchers. They don't have a, like a mosquito has, a, a um, piercing mouth part, they have pinchers. And so, um, I, you know, I don't really worry about it, except if I have a black widow around, I usually um, make sure that no, child is around or I move it to some place that it won't be. And I've never, some, the brown recluse isn't native to this area. It's been introduced into houses by um, travel, by people moving and bringing materials. Yeah. So you've been studying biology, botany for a while. Um, and as you reflect on your career and look forward, at, especially some of the undergraduates in the room and studying this particular discipline, what are some of the challenges and some of the opportunities that you see for the future of this discipline? Challenges and opportunity. Well, there's, uh, you know, there's always, there's always room for discovery. Um, but I think that and Gary can probably um, agree that it's getting much more mathematical and, um, and also uh, on the one side and also uh, much more chemical um, um, on the other. And so probably the days of doing the kind of work that I do um, or have done during my career, um, you know, it's not really going to be the main thrust in the future. Um, I, I, I think, because I've been watching you for a long time, uh, and, and I think that your, your career is what you did is you, you, you basically did the fearless biologist. Uh, the what? Where, where you got into a system. Yeah. And then you followed that system. Mm -hmm. and, and as you learned more and more, you could then... And branch out the into... I just let it take me wherever it went. And I wasn't wedded to one particular pro type of project. Some people will spend their whole time just doing you know, going to another plant or, you know, yeah, species. Yeah, or somebody decides they're going to be they're interested in mating behavior. Yeah, or mating behavior. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, uh, let me just mention what males do, you know. Males, um, when the females are aggressive, and the males need to somehow mate with them. So what do they do? Well, first off, the females give off a pheromone that attracts the males from a distance. The males get on the web, and when they get within a couple centimeters of the female without being eaten, they spray her with a um, chemical that causes them to fall over on their side in a catalepsis. So they drug them. <laughs> and once they've drugged them and they're laying there on their sides, they can do whatever they want. <laughs> Um, for as long as it's necessary. Oh no, I don't think that's a parallel with humans. <laughs> so it's you know it's it's been a really fun system for me to work with all these years, and you know I've gotten to travel around the world, um, going to really neat places, and uh, and I you know I have a curious mind, so I think that's. You know, it's been really great. Why don't you just uh, give a, a short vignette? I think you've done biology at a box to this group before, but a lot of this crowd wasn't here then. Just give them a little synopsis. Uh, if you're not familiar with biology at a box. Okay, I have uh, I have two outreach programs. One started a long, long time ago um, in the schools, um, Knox County schools, because I was um, once they found out that um, my son had a mother who was a biologist. I was always invited to the schools and so one day I um, 
we had in the attic at, um, in Burge Hall. It was Burge Hall back then. Was it Burge? No, no, Burge was in Wisconsin. Um, and anyway, in one of the, um, in the attic up, uh, I found a trunk that had zoology stenciled across it, and I said, aha, I took this wooden trunk, I put some sand and dirt in it, and then I put some of my fossil collection in it and some other things that weren't fossils. And I wrote an exercise for the school kids and I gave it to the librarian uh, of uh, the Powell Elementary where my son was. And about oh, a month later she said, all 1,200 kids have had the opportunity to do this box. The older kids served as reading buddies for the exercise. What's the next box? <laughs> and then it was uh, skulls and teeth because I had a skull collection. And so um, that started biology in a box. Uh, we were given, uh, the university gave us a house. Uh, well, first we were out, out where the uh, women's soccer fields are now. And then they, we had to move us. So we have a house on Terrace Avenue. And we have, um, our, we have um, 11 themes, different box themes now. And um, they are in 140 school systems. So we're reaching, we're reaching over 300,000 students um, each year, hopefully. Um, if they just do one exercise, um, you know, when each box has, you know, um, some, some of the boxes have as many as 100 exercises that utilize the materials. So you can go on the website, Biology in a Box website, to see that. Um, and we're, right now we're doing a lot of um, depends upon what box keeper I have at a given um, time, what they're most interested in. And the, the, my current one is most interested in um, reaching out with um, videos of kids um, that are actually explaining what each exercise does and, and a big YouTube presence. So um, these are things that are going to continue after I leave. Um, I'm, I'm retiring this year <coughs> at the end of the semester. So uh, we have a new person that uh, Liz Derryberry from my department is going to take over biology in a box, but I'll still be involved. It's just that I won't be in charge of it anymore. And I have um, uh, another person taking over my other educational project, which is Vols Teach, uh, which is a, it's a STEM um, um, preparation program so that um, a student in science or math can get a degree in their major plus teaching credentials for high school, secondary ed. And so those were my sort of two projects that have taken me away from my research, which I enjoyed most, but they were, it was important to do. So. Um, Ball Street program. Yeah. Well, what happened is the two Susans uh, were recruited by um, a prior dean, um, and we thought we would just get some assistant professor or somebody to do it. And it turned out you had to be a full professor. So we got wrote the grant, we got the money, and then we were stuck with it. So you know, we did it. And, That's been a very good program. <coughs> Let's yeah. thank Dr. Reichert for a lovely program. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for coming.